All right. I just want to sit down after that. Man, that was, I, I tell you, I, um, I won't belabor, but uh, I'll just say thank you from my heart. Um, I know that when Dad said, or, you know, Pastor, you know, that um, I wanted to come back and work with family, um, I met you guys too. Um, I met you guys too. Um, you know, growing up, I didn't have the most unstable growings up, but we moved around a lot, um, five or six times in several different ministries. Um, and though Kentucky is where I'm from, this is, this is home. And um, many of you are, um, are real family uh, to me and now to my wife. Um, grew up, some calling you uncles and aunts, and uh, many of you have um, served as, you know, uh, real, just real family. And um, I'm looking forward to when I have kids one day, Lord willing, they're nothing like me. Uh, <laughs> one of these days, they're going to be running around and calling you guys aunt and uncle and knowing no better. And I don't want them to know any better. Um, I love you folks dearly. And uh, I always get nervous uh, when I come to preach because I feel like, you know, uh, it's family. And so that can be good. That can be bad. Uh, so I remember when I, was, when I first surrendered to preach, um, it's funny, um, Dad, I would let him know when I was preaching. He would always say, good. And, and he would ask me, what are you preaching on? And I'd tell him this. And he'd ask if I needed any help. And sometimes I did. Sometimes I didn't. At least that's what I thought. And, <laughs> but every time he'd always say, well, you'll have to preach it to the, in family devotions before you preach it anywhere else. So it would like got censored. And uh, so, uh, so, but this message, he didn't censor this one. So who knows, y'all? Everybody buckle in. But we're going to, uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing tonight. Um, I was, somebody was teasing and saying that they can't wait to hear what Hannah has to say tonight, her message. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I'm glad that I surrendered to the call to be a pastor and married a preacher. So, <laughs> I'm just being serious. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I mean, hopefully this will be a blessing. I, I, I was talking... Um, uh, about my message, me and my wife were just, you know, talking about, you know, are you excited to preach? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I tell you, those many home runs as we had these past couple of weeks, I hope I just get on base. Uh, but this is a message, I, I'll be honest with you, um, be transparent. This is a message that has come to me in a way that I have never had a message come to me in the sense of God speaking to my heart through this message. And I sincerely hope and pray it'll be a blessing to you. But this message... I'm going back here to grab something. This message is really a regurgitation of one of the messages that, uh, that changed my life. This is a trophy. This has nothing to do with sports. This was my junior year at camp. And the title of the theme that week was Step Up to the Plate. And we won the Spirit Award that year. Our camp did. And I won the uh, Camper of the Week. It was the first time I ever received that award. That message changed it, it changed my life. There are not many weeks that go by. I don't think of that phrase in that message. I mean that. Ever since I heard that message, that's the only message, the only message that I think about on a weekly basis. Because there was a preacher on an afternoon, on an afternoon, And he preached a message like this. And it wasn't a message that he was shouting a bunch. It wasn't a message that he had a lot of enthusiasm. He just said, who's going to step up to the plate? That's all he said. Who's going to step up to the plate? Somebody's got to swing. Who's going to step up to the plate? 
And he had a home plate that he bought. And at the invitation, all he said was, I have a couple permanent markers. And he said, for those of you that will make a decision to step up to the plate in your Christian life, I want you to come write your name. But only, he said, I don't want you to write your name down on this home plate. If that's not a decision you'll make in your heart. I'm not asking you to make that decision. I'm not telling you to make that decision. But if you'll make that decision, if that's something you really want to do for God, I want you to come down here and I want you to sign, I want you to sign this home plate. And I remember as a teenager, with all my heart, I walked down and I grabbed that marker and I put my name on that home plate. And I said, God, I can't swing hard. I may not hit far, but I just want to step up to the plate. That's my title. I don't really have, I'll be honest, I don't really have a text verse. I have a couple of verses we're going to turn to. I want you to think about that. Who's going to step up to the plate? I've been teaching the past couple of weeks in junior church and in Sunday school about heavy hitters. And I asked them the first week, I said, when you think of a heavy hitter, what's a word that comes to mind? When you think of a heavy hitter, what comes to mind? Some of them said, fearless, strong, you know, powerful. And those are, when we think of heavy hitter, we think fearless, we think strong, we think confident, we think able, capable. Those are words that come to mind. And certainly... Those are descriptions, as a child of God, can describe us. Because all of us, you know, you think, about it, you think about a baseball team. If a baseball team has a couple of, maybe if two heavy hitters, they gotta, they got, they're fortunate. You know, if you've got people that are batting in the 300 or higher, you know, uh, and, and they're really, you know, putting in the home runs, you're, you're fortunate. You know, to have one, you know, to have one is, is outstanding. But to have more than one is, you know, just, uh, you know, incredible. You know, we're on the winning side. Amen. We're on the winning side. Right. So all of us can be a heavy hitter. Amen. I think of fearless. I think of 2 Timothy 1.7. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We have nothing to fear when God is near. We can all be fearless. We can face, you know, I tell you what, when the pitcher gets up, a heavy hitter, he's not afraid. When a heavy hitter gets up, most of the time the pitcher, do you think, how many, how, how many of us would really think that nine times out of ten, Babe Ruth was afraid of the pitcher? Think about that. I think nine times out of ten, that pitcher was afraid of Babe Ruth. That guy knew what he was doing. When he stepped up to the plate, he wasn't knocking his knees. He was dusting off his shoes and, you know, Pointing out to where he was going to, I think, oh, right there, not right there. Right. Heavy hitter. You know, all of us as child of, children of God, we can all be heavy hitters. Right, right. We don't have anything to fear. We can be fearless. We have curveballs. How many of us have curve, have had curveballs this, this week? Uh, my wife and I, we went, we came home last night, and our AC went out. We got, I think, I think it was like 86 degrees in our house. And you know, we get home, and I'm trying to get ready for the next day, and I'm thinking, here comes a curveball. You know. We hear that curveball. How many of us have curveballs, fastballs, things that come, you know, by us? They come at us fast. They come at us hard, uh, direct, right? Fastballs, curveballs, splitters, you know, whatever, knuckleballs. There's all different kinds of pitches that come our way. We don't see them coming. Sometimes they look the same as a pitch before, and then it has a different movement on it, right? And, I mean, there are things that come in our life, in our week, in our workplace, in our relationships, and they're, they're all different kinds of pitches. But we can be fearless, we can be confident. Or we can be strong. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You know, the, the great thing about it is if I was to ask every one of us, can you do a work for God? And if you say yes, without saying only in the, only in the power of God, then I would have to say you're wrong. Can I do a work for God? No, I can't. I can't do a work for God. Can you, can you as an individual do a work for God? No. Not for very long, not in your flesh, not for very long. Can you do a work for God with God's power and God's strength? Yes, you can. Amen. Yes, you can. Of course you can. 
And all of us need to be doing something for God. All of us need to be not just on the team, but in the lineup. Amen. There, there's, there's a lot of people that are, that are, on, that are, in, on, the, that are on the team, but are not in the lineup. We need people that are in the lineup. We, we need to be strong, be strong in the Lord. I, I'm so thankful for that message Brother Tyler preached. Yeah. My goodness. There, there is no, there's no, quali God does not have any qualifications other than that we be surrendered yeah. and that we be faithful. Good. See, there's a lot of people that are faithful but not surrendered. A lot of people come to church, but they're not surrendered. A lot of people that are surrendered that aren't faithful. I'll do a work for God when I want. More of required and stewards that a man be found faithful. You got to be both. You can't, you can't have one without the other. You got to be surrendered and faithful. That's all God requires. Faithfulness, surrenderedness. That's it. When I found that out, when I as a, as a teenage young man, at that week of camp, I mean, I was always a short guy. I, it's so funny. And everybody says that I'm tall. I was never tall, ever. Okay, let's put it this way. When I was in seventh grade, I was four foot nine. I was so, no, don't say all, okay? <laughs> that is not cute. When I was in the seventh grade, we came to school, and at the time, you had to be taller than four foot nine to, sit, to not sit in a booster seat. So we'd pull up to school, and we had a minivan. They'd slide that door back, and the only way you can put a, a booster seat is in the bucket seats in the front. You got the bench, you got the bucket seats in the front. So they open it up. Here's all my buddies getting out of their cars, and I'm getting out of a booster seat. My guy's like, wow, man, nice seat, got the tactical cups and holders and everything. I was like, mom, drop me off at the dumpster, and I'll walk to school. I was, I was a small guy. I was always a really short guy. I, 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 was I, was, I got called. My, so here's some of my nicknames. Short bus, because I was short and a little chunky. <laughs> Call me short bus. They called me small fry, little guy. I got that all the time. Little guy, you know, little John, you know, this kind of thing. And then when I got to high school, I had like a six-inch growth spurt in like four months, I think. And so then I, I grew up out of it. But it's funny, when I went to the doctor, our, our whole family, they've all been 5'9". My uncle got the 5'9 in the ninth grade. Boom, right? Dad was, well, I think he was like 5'7". I think he grew a little bit out of high school. I, I, was, I was at that time, I was like, God, please, just 5'4", something. Just not, I, I don't want to, I was like 13 years old, going on 13, 4 foot 9, wearing a size 6 shoe. And... So I had all those names, you know, and stuff. I was a little guy. And then, you know, I, I, I had this big growth spurt. So don't make fun of the little guy, all right? Because now when I go talk to these guys that made fun of me, I'm like, hey, buddy, how you doing? <laughs> so uh, but anyway, but you know what? You get to looking around at people, and you're going to be able to point fingers and say, I can't do it like them. I can't teach like them. I, I, I can't soul win like them. I, I, there's no way I could ever conduct a class or there's no way I could ever be a part of the ministry because I don't have that kind of person. God's not looking for personalities. Right, right, right. I, I remember something that caught my attention when I was in Bible college. So, the pastor uh, of the church here, he said, I never, he said, I never look for a staff member based upon their personality. I always base it upon their character. He said, most of the time, personality will fail you. Yeah. Because personality is there when the sun is shining. Character is there every day. Yeah. Right. So just because somebody, and if, if, you're, if, if, you, if God has given you a personality, God has, I mean, I think the reason why God called me is because he knew I wasn't going to shut up. <laughs> Not because I was scared to preach, but because he's like, I got to give him, I gotta, he's gonna, if he's going to be on our side, let's give him something to say. But I was always, I was always, you know, I, that caught my attention. It doesn't matter how bright your smile is. It doesn't matter how bubbly your personality is. What matters is your surrenderness. What matters is your faithfulness. So we can be strong. We can be confident. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can be able. Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us so these aren't my points for the message, but these are just some examples that we all can be heavy hitters. And I want to build this because I want us to realize when, we, when I say step up to the plate, all of us 
can step up to the plate and be a heavy hitter. All of us can step up to the plate and make a difference. You know what? Sometimes it's the little things that make the biggest differences. We think that the people that are up here preaching and we think that the people that are up there teaching, they're making the biggest difference. I can tell you from personal experience and being here in this church that some of the biggest differences weren't even during a church service, but was just a faithful Christian being a godly example. And then when it came time for ministry, seeing people working their jobs from uh, 60 hours, 70 hours a week, putting in the time, and then coming and being a part of a ministry, helping with the setup, helping, seeing that as a young man, that impacted my life almost more than any preacher did. Because being able to see somebody have character and a heart for God. We think that it's just these big altar calls. I tell you, the only time that there's business done at these altar calls is when a heart is being spoken to. And there are some times that that heart has been being worked on so many times. You have no idea when somebody comes up here to do business how many times the Lord has been pricking their heart. And it could be because some of you have been a heavy hitter and you didn't know it. And if there's somebody here and you haven't stepped up to the plate... I tell you this, we're running out of hitters. The rotation's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The need is getting greater. Uh, The evil, it's only getting more powerful. The fastballs are only coming faster. Uh, The curveballs are only getting wider. And folks, we're rally time. I have a a great, there's a a story I'm going to read of what has been voted as the greatest home run in baseball history. That phrase, rally time, is only for the ninth inning. It's only for the time when you're down and you have a chance to come back. That's not for, you don't rally in the fourth inning. You get it together. You don't really rally in the seventh or eighth inning. You try to get it together. You rally when it's your, I mean, this is it. If we don't get it here, fellas, we're not going to, we don't have another inning. This is it. It is time to, folks, we're in the last inning. These are, this is it. This is the time. If we don't rally now, we're not going to have a chance. We're not going to to have anything to show for it in this last inning. I don't know about you. The the story that I'm going to read, I'm going to read part of it. The comeback came in the last inning. It was the last at bat, the last swing, the last hitter up to bat. It was rally time. It was time to make a difference. The difference was now. It came in 1960. Pittsburgh Pirates. They were a huge underdog against the, dy- the dynastic New York Yankees, who had already at this time captured 16 World Series titles since Pittsburgh's last title in 1925. The Yankees occupied baseball's penthouse. The Pirates languished in its basements. The perennial doormats were so downtrodden that Hollywood cast them as a major league team in need of divine intervention in a 1951 comedy movie called Angels in the Outfield. That was made about the Pittsburgh Pirates because they were so bad. Through the first six games of the 1960 World Series, the Bronx Bombers, as they were called, lived up to their nickname by outscoring the Pirates 46-17 to through the series. But while New York routed Pittsburgh by scores of 16-3, to Game two, 10 to zero, game three, and 12 to zero, game six, the Pirates won the closer game, six to four in game one, three to two in game four, and five to two in game five. 36,683 fans filled Forbes Field for game seven on the afternoon of Thursday, October 13th, 1960. Bassed in unreasonably warm temperatures and a fast start by the Pirates, who jumped to a 4 0 lead after two innings, Law, the pitcher, Blanked the Yankees until Bill Scourin's fifth inning home run when the first two batters reached base in the sixth inning. Law was relieved by Roy Face, who had been stellar in saving all three of Pittsburgh's victories in the series. After Yankee super, superstar Mickey Mantle singled to make the score 4-2, to two, Yogi Berra blasted a three-run homer to put the Yankees ahead. The New York played it two more runs in the eighth inning to make the score 7-4 to four and push the Pirates to the brink. With the Yankees only six outs away from yet another title, the Pirates came to the plate against New York hurler Bobby Shantz, who faced the minimum 15 batters since entering in the third inning. After pinch, pinch hitter 
Gino, Camilio, I think these guys were mobsters, <laughs> opening, in, opening the inning with a single Pittsburgh center fielder, Bill Verdon, hit with what looked like a sure double play ball. But while Pirates fans held their breath, Yankee shortstop Tony Kubek lost it when, his, when Verdon's grounder struck a rock and hit his throat. Instead of turning two for a double play, Kubek left for the hospital with bruised vocal cords. The Pirates made it on base. Pirates fans, however, were in full force as Grote followed with run scoring single to slice the Yankees' lead to only two runs. Four batters later, defensive replacement Hal Smith blasted a three-run homer over Barra's head in left field that put the Pirates now ahead 9-7. Needing just three outs to win the title, the Pirates reliever, Bob Friend, took the mound. Although he had eight runs in the six innings he had pitched in the series, Friend continued his recent trend by relinquishing consecutive singles. Pittsburgh manager Danny Murdahl relieved Friend with Harvey Haddix to face the New York's lineup. After Roger Maris's pop-up, Mickey Mantle hit a run-scoring single, and Barra followed with a fielder's choice to tie the score at nine. As the Yankees sent the game to the bottom of the ninth, everything was all knotted up. Known more for his glove, that was his nickname, the glove, Bill Masarowski stepped up to the plate to lead off the bottom of the ninth. At this point, Bill Masarowski later admittedly got caught up in the sudden turn of events, and it seemed the second baseman had forgotten that he was to lead off the bottom half of the inning, and it wasn't until first base coach Lenny Levy reminded him of that fact that he hurriedly picked up a bat and stepped up to the mound. The 24-year-old averaged only 10 home runs a year in his five seasons in the major leagues. But at precisely 3.36 p.m. local time, on a 1-0 count, Bill Mazarowski swung for the fences and connected with Terry's second pitch. He later said, I almost was at second base when the ball finally went over. Mazarowski said, I was running so hard just trying to make sure I'd get to third. Then it took a moment, for a moment or two to realize what had happened. It was gone. Home run. Delirious Pirates fans stormed the field and joined the celebration at home plate. It was a magical conclusion to an enchanted year for the team dubbed Destiny's Darling. Game seven almost made history in that, uh, game seven also made history in that none of the 77 batters who came to plate for the Pittsburgh Pirates struck out, making it the only postseason game devoid of strikeouts. This would be the only World Series ending walk-off home run until 1993. Home run. Bill Mazarowski stepped up to the plate. Ninth inning, tied up. I mean, like, you know, like we, like we do as kids. Five, four, three, you know, fade away, you know. That was it. Bill, he stepped up to the plate. Let me, let me talk about a couple of giants that we know have stepped up to the plate. Because I tell you, if we don't step up to the plate, then who is? If we won't take a swing, then who will? How about Noah? Aren't you glad Noah stepped up to the plate? Genesis 6, 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 2 Peter 2, 5, And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Turn to 1 Kings 18, 20. 1 Kings 18, 20. How about Elisha? Aren't you glad Elisha stepped up to the plate? I mean, we hear about these people. We hear about these folks that step up to the plate. And we hear about some of the amazing things that they do, but, but let's look at how they step up to the plate. Let's look at the conditions. They, you know what? Every time somebody steps up to the plate that we're going to talk about and that we've already talked about, there was pressure. There was pressure. Pressure produces champions. Yeah. Pressure produces champions. Right. And if we think that we're going to be the Christians we ought to breed with no pressure, then we're not going to be victors. Right. We're going to settle. We're going to sink in. And we're not going to swing for the fences. Ah, just get on base will be good enough. No, we need a run. We need a score. We need somebody willing to take a swing on a 1-0 count. Bottom of the ninth inning, you're up to bat. This could be it. Elisha here in 1 Kings 18.20 says this, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, Hast thou also brought, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse. And so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elisha came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? 
If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call you on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Elijah was stepping up to the plate. Yes. There was a drought. It was dry. People were thirsty. And I will tell you this, it is dry in this nation. People are thirsty for the gospel. Yeah. There's only one drink of water that will quench their thirst, and it's not found in any type of movie. It's not found in any type of form of entertainment, whether it be music, whether it be our phones, whether it be a game, whether it be our shopping list. There is nothing to quench the thirst outside of salvation by grace through faith and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I will tell you, believers, if we're not careful, we will be like these people and these na the nation of Israel watching and seeing which God is God. Elisha already chose. He knew who was God. And if we're a Christian and we're saying, I'm not sure what, what boat I want to get on, which direction I want to go, do I, do I stay faithful to God? Do I go to church? Do I, do I get involved in ministry? Or do I just kind of live a good life, be a good neighbor, be a good example? That's not what God's looking for. And so he steps up to the plate. You know what's interesting about Mount Carmel? This is awesome. This is awesome. You're going to love it. I don't think you're ready. You're going to love it. Mount Carmel was a place of idol worship for Baal. This was a heathen mountain. The Pharaoh of Egypt has documented worship on the mountain of Mount Carmel. This was not a holy mountain. This was a blasphemous mountain. This was going to their temple. This is where... Heathen nations would come and make sacrifices. Even Pharaoh would make sacrifices here. And the, the prophets of Baal, this was not a new place to them. They knew of Mount Carmel. Do you know what symbol Baal takes a form of? Anybody want to guess? It's a bull. And he said, get us two bullocks. Get us two. Let's go to Mount Carmel. You guys know where that's at? Hey, let's go to Mount Carmel. Let's get a bull. And we're going to see whose God is God. I mean, he went, I mean, this guy, Elisha, talk about a trash talker. <laughs> then he goes up and they're cutting themselves, which was normal. That was, it was, it was normal for that worship. That wasn't, that, that, and I tell you this, people that, people that, that serve the God of this world, they're in pain. Yes. Yeah. I tell you this, there's pain in their eyes. Yeah. There's pain in their heart. When nobody's listening, when, when they're by themselves, when a believer can get on their knees and spend time with God, you think about somebody who doesn't believe, they have no one. They're, they're in pain. And so here, the prophets of Baal put themselves in pain, and they say, oh, Baal. And Elisha's going there, and he said, where is he at? Is he gone? I bet he's on a trip. Where's Baal? I don't see him. And it just makes a fit. Then what happens? Elisha says, oh, Dig a trench. Oh, and by the way, put some water on it. I mean, this guy, you would not want to be playing against. He was that guy on the other side of the team. And you're like, I hope I get a fast pitch and it's right in his teeth. You know? He, I mean, he's over here. He's, but you know what he's doing? He's stepping up. Think about the odds. He was fearless. He had nothing to fear because he had faith. Hey, he was strong. He was strong in his faith. He knew, he, he presented the challenge. He said, let's go to the temple. Let's go to the heathen mound. Let's get the bulls. Let's go, let's go get your symbol for your God. Let's bring them up to the mountain. Let's cover them in water. And we're going to ask and pray and see which God answers prayer. He was confident. But you know what he also knew? God was able. Amen. He knew God was able. And what do we find? We find the fire coming down and then smoke. And Elijah stands there and he says, you see these heathen nations? They ought not to be followed. God sends a miracle, sends rain. We hear about Elisha. How about, how about David? Are we, are we glad for David? Let's look for 1 Samuel 17, verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Man, what a verse. What a powerful verse. 
Is there not a reason? Is there not, is there not a cause for us to step up to the plate? Is there not a reason for us to have faith in God? Look at the giant. You think about the Goliath. Goliath had several hundred pounds between his armor and his, and his weaponry that he was carrying like it was a t-shirt. And here we have David. You know, David being a shepherd is not a romantic position. He's not no cowboy of the middle of the Middle Eastern region of the country. When we think of like, you know, giddy up little doggies, we think of a cowboy, you know, right? And his hat, you know. Somebody said, you're not a cowboy, and why do you wear boots? I said, I don't know, but some of you guys wear sports jerseys, and you ain't no athlete. <laughs> so that was in college. I didn't say that here. That was in college. <laughs> But here, David, you know, when Jesse lined up all his boys, who was missing? Who was, he, well, who was missing? David. What job was he doing? You know what he was doing? He was sleeping outside. He was on the wet ground. He was in the hot sun. Sheep are smelly. They smell terrible because they have all that wool and it just traps everything. This was not a beautiful job. We think of David like, oh, he's with the little lambs playing his harp. He's out there, you know. That's not the job. Dave, that was the leftover job. That, that was a job sometimes that people were put in position so they would be killed. Because guess what was lurking around the sheep? The lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Because what did David go up against when he came to Saul? And he said, I haven't proved the armor that I was given. But he said, but I have fought a lion. I fought a bear. Because he was a shepherd. He was at a place and in a position that was unfavorable. You feel like you're in a position sometimes in your life where you feel folks are against you? You feel maybe the, the atmosphere that you're in is against you? But you know what David didn't do? He didn't get a sour attitude. You know what he did instead when nobody was looking, when nobody else cared? David was making music in his heart and with his mouth to the Lord. He became a cunning player with the harp. And he did that while doing a job that nobody else would probably want to do. David had an opportunity during that time to prove himself. You know, God may be putting you through something to prove you. Because he wants you to do something bigger. But he's got to know you got it in you. He's got to know when you get up and you grab that sling, that you have no fear in your heart and in your mind when you face that giant. The Bible says, here's the best part. The Bible says that David, in verse number 47, hasted, and what does the Bible say at the last part? What does it say? Ran. That old boy had no fear. He was fearless. David was strong in his faith. He said, this uncircumcised Philistine, he said, is there not a cause who is going to step up to the plate? David was strong. David was small. David was not thought of. David was confident, confident in his God. And you know what God made him? Made him able. Able to defeat a giant. And now it's talked about in sports, just that David defeats Goliath. The ultimate symbol of taking the victory from somebody who would be a champion. You know what? We don't have to look at our battles and compare our strength with their strength. When David went and fought Goliath, he did not compare himself to Goliath. He compared God right. to Goliath. Right. You got Goliaths in your life? Are you afraid? Are you, instead of confident, are you nervous? Instead of fearless, are you fearful? Instead of strong, are you weak? And instead of able, are you incapable? Well, let me ask you something. Have you compared them to God? Have you compared your problem to God? I don't care if it's a relationship, if it's a finance, if it's a spiritual, if it's a mental, if it's a healthy. Have you compared it to God? How about Daniel? Daniel 1.8, the last place we'll turn to. Daniel 1.8. Daniel 1.8 says this. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Purposed in his heart. They couldn't take away from it. Let me tell you something, teenager. Let me tell you something, folks. When you make a decision for God, I, was, I can tell you this. I was so challenged. That decision that I made was not on that home plate. It is not on these decision cards that we make decisions. It's in our heart. You can't take that decision away from me. You can't throw it away. I didn't put it on paper. I made it in my heart. 
Take it. Go ahead. Try. You can't take it. Daniel purposed in his heart. He didn't need somebody to remind him. He didn't need somebody to tell him, Daniel, don't eat the meat. Daniel said, I purposed in my heart. What do we have purpose in our heart? What is purpose in our heart is what's put in on purpose. Think about that. Whatever is purpose in our heart was put there on purpose. You made a decision. You did it with thinking, with thought. Daniel purpose in his heart. How about Paul? Aren't we glad Paul stepped up to the plate? Little Paul, the tent maker. Little Paul, the blind man. Paul would eventually from that, that, that time that, in the Damascus Road would become feeble in his sight. But aren't we glad that Paul stepped up to the plate? And in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7 it says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Man, these are heavy hitters. But look at what kind of hitters they were. They weren't Goliath. It was David. You see, you know why David is so amazing? It's because David shouldn't have won. So you're facing a problem. You think there's a ministry you can't be involved in? Well, who are you looking at? Because when God saw David, he didn't see the stature of Eliab. He saw the surrender of David. Amen. How about Obadiah Holmes? You say, who's Obadiah Holmes? I'm glad you asked. Obadiah Holmes was a pastor in Rhode Island who stood up courageously for God to preach the gospel. And not many people know this, but to preach the gospel on the east coast of the United States was once a crime punishable in some areas by death. Obadiah Holmes preached the gospel. And he was bailed out by someone who saw pity on him and two other preachers to bail him out from his sentence. And Obadiah Holmes refused payment for preaching, refused bail for preaching the gospel. They whipped him 30 times. 30 times. The beating was so bad that for over two months he could only find rest by sleeping on his knees and his hands. Obadiah Holmes received the beatings from his back with the blood coming down and onlookers in horror and said, you have whipped me as with roses. I'm glad Obadiah Holmes stood up. I'm glad he stood up to the plate. Because you know what happened? A chain reaction. And there became a plea for the governors to let men of God preach the word without hindrance and punishment. And today, with men like him here in the United States, we have had a history and a heritage far beyond any other where we can get up and preach the gospel. We can carry our Bibles and we forget what it cost. Do you know who his great, great, great grandson was? Abraham Lincoln. I'm thankful that Obadiah Holmes took the meetings and said, You with me? As with roses. I'm thankful for Hudson Taylor who for 51 years poured his life into bringing Christ behind the closed doors of China, founded the China Inland Mission and had over 800 missionaries brought into the country. Hudson Taylor was a prayer warrior and a giant of the faith. He was able to speak several Chinese dialects and help translate the New Testament into the dialect used in Shanghai, where he spent many years of his life. And unlike many European missionaries, Taylor was careful of Chinese culture, respecting their way of life, even adopting their own clothing. He faced sickness and loss with the spirit of unshaken trust, leaving behind a legacy that has inspired thousands of missionaries in all corners of the world. And he had these words, all God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his being with them. He said this, when I cannot read, when I cannot think, when I cannot even pray, I can trust. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust. Trust him more. I'm thankful that we had some soul winners this past week step up to the plate. And we got to see six individuals make a profession of faith and bow their heart and accept Christ as their personal Savior on hot days, on uncomfortable days, on days that the sacrifice almost seemed great. But I'm thankful that somebody said they're worth it. We'll step up to the plate. We'll start a bus route. They're worth it. Because if nobody steps up to the plate in their town and on their street and at their house, then who will? Who's going to swing for the fences for those who can't swing for themselves? 
That's what a pinch hitter is. He swings for somebody who can't swing for themselves. And there's people out there that they can't swing for themselves. And they need a heavy hitter to come down their street, knock on their door. Somebody tells me that so many doesn't work. I say, you're a liar. You haven't worked at it. It's hard work. There's been weeks where I've gone and others have gone where nobody gets saved and the door is slammed in your face and people walk away. But then you come to a door and somebody says, I don't know Christ is my Savior, but I want to know how. And you see the tears come in their eyes and you see them bow their heart and you see them get saved and it changes their life just like it changed yours. Could you believe what it would be like if the person or the preacher that influenced your life, that you surrendered, that you uh, answered God's, uh, God's call to salvation, could could you believe if they had the same mentality some of us do when it comes to soul winning? You might be on your way to a devil's hell. So who's going to be a heavy hitter for that person in your neighborhood, and in our town, and in this area of the country? Who's going to step up to the plate? Who's going to be fearless? Who's going to be strong? Who's going to be confident? Who's going to say it's rally time? Yes, this is it. We don't have much time left. Right. Our problem in churches today is not that we have many dead, too many dead beats. Rather, we have too many alive beats that aren't dead to self. Pastor Bobby Robertson once was evangelist Lester Roloff, spending time traveling together. Brother Bobby said something that he thought might offend his dear friend, Brother Roloff. And he said, Brother Roloff, I'm sorry for what I said. I wouldn't want to say anything that would offend you. Brother Roloff said in return, Brother Bobby, if you offended me, it's my fault because I'm supposed to be dead. We don't have too many dead beats. We have too many alive beats in church. Too many people living for self. Too many people living for a paycheck. Too many people living for a promotion. Too many people living for recognition. We need to say, I want to live for that crown of glory. I want to live to hear my Savior say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. See, wood, hay, and stubble, that's what gets thrown into the fire. God's not looking. He's, here, here's the great thing about God. God doesn't measure quality, quantity. God measures quality. It's not always about how much you do for God. But what are you doing for God? What are you doing that's making a difference? What am I doing that's making a difference? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's the Bible. That's not me. That's not pastor. That's the Bible. That's what God had to say. When I was a teenage young man, I heard these stories and I said, man, I want to have that kind of testimony. That when I get up to heaven, I can look over the banks and to my next door neighbor and maybe see somebody that I reached at a VBS or at a, on a bus or out so and I, there's somebody I want to see and say, it's so good to see you again. Who are we reaching? Are we reaching nobody? Is nobody affected? Is nobody touched? Must I go in empty handed? It's rally time. Who's going to step up to the plate? It's a battlefield, brother. Not a recreation room. Church is not something that we just do on Sunday. I looked at a coworker, he said, I'm not religious. And I said, Good, me neither. What do you mean? I said, religion is what people do on Sunday. I'm a Christian. That's what I do the rest of the week. A Christian is not a denomination. It's a decision. Being a Christian, people tell me they're a Christian. That's not a denomination. That is a decision. Because Christian came about to those who lived like Christ. Holy living, surrendered living, making a difference. Who, somebody shared the gospel with us, folks. Somebody shared it with us. If you are saved and you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior by grace, through faith, in your heart, somebody shared it with you. Now you think about that. Somebody shared it with you. Somebody didn't care what they looked like in public. Somebody didn't care that they stuttered or that they had to read the track. 
Somebody didn't care that they looked foolish. They would be embarrassed at the door. That's not my thing. I just don't do that kind of stuff. They didn't care about that. They said, there's somebody out there that was just like me. They were just like me. And I want to reach them. I'm so thankful that there were some visitors in here from a man in our church that's been laid up in a hospital. Don't tell me you can't invite somebody to church. There's a girl right now. Her name is Heather Cave. She has most of her brain removed. She has been in the hospital almost all her life. Most of her brain removed. She's on a tube. She just led one of her nurses to the Lord. I mean, she cannot make conversation. She remembers very little. She knows how to sing, and she knows how to give the gospel. Outside of that, it's very limited. She's on a tube in the hospital. In a, on a tube in the hospital. Who is giving folks the gospel? I have two eyes, two hands, two feet. She's in a bed. That crown that she's going to receive, I'd hate to be in line after her. Because the widow didn't give more. She just gave all. She gave all. She said, I'm going to step up to the plate. I can't swing hard. I can't hit far. But I can step up to the plate. Well, I'm thankful for those who cheer on. I'm afraid there are too many fans and not enough teammates. I'll support the ministries, but don't expect me to be involved. I'll support the soul winning, but don't expect me to be a soul winner. Being a soul winner, folks, I'm telling you, it's not just on Saturdays. I'm not here to say that if you're not here on the soul winning Saturday meeting, then bless God, get your act together. That's not what I'm saying. That doesn't work out for everybody. Your schedules aren't the same. I'm not saying that. We have organized meetings, and if it works out, we'd love to have folks. I understand that people have work schedules. I get it. I'm not here to make a plug for Saturday soul winning. I'm not here to make a plug for I'm not here to make a plug for Thursday night soul winning. I'm here to say to be a, that we need to be a soul winner. Soul winning has nothing to do with the time that it is. It has nothing to do when it's organized. That is not what soul winning is. Soul winning is finding someone that you can give the gospel to. That's what soul winning is. You don't have to come to Saturday soul winning to be a soul winner, but be a soul winner. You don't have to come to Thursday night visitation to be a soul winner, but be a soul winner. You say, well, how do I be a soul winner? Glad you asked. Good question. We have this gospel track. It has it laid out here. You can read this to somebody. I have read this to somebody in a foreign language through Google Translate, not making it up, and gave them a witness. You can, I have been with somebody who are so introverted. For them to be at the door was a miracle. And then literally read the gospel track and see someone saved. God's not looking for a dynamic personality that's loud and boisterous. He's looking for somebody faithful and surrendered. I'll support the work, but don't expect me to, be, to help with the effort. Hey, don't take time to criticize if you won't take time to try. Don't take time to criticize our bus workers and, and our pastor and our staff and our school if you won't take time to try. I'm always saying that. I grew up here. This is home to me, y'all. This is my church. I mean, you may, there may be people sitting in the pew saying, well, this is my church. I don't know why he's talking. This is my church. I was 13 years old. I've grown up here. This is family. And, and we and we're need to do our dead level best. We need to try. Don't criticize if you're not going to try. And if you're trying... I guarantee you're not being critical. Because you know it's hard. As they say in the South, it ain't easy, folks. And you look foolish. You say things all the time that you're like, man, that size 11 boot fits right in my mouth. Don't take time to criticize if you won't take time to try. But who's going to step up to the plate at home? Who's going to take time to step up to the plate at work, in our church, in our friendships, in our relationships, in our nation. I'll say this, though. Too many folks willing to carry a banner around Washington, D.C. that won't help in a church ministry. That's not, what, that's not what Christianity is all about. Being a Christian nation has nothing to do with politics. Nothing. We were a Christian nation before it was allowed. 
Obadiah Holmes, you think he was allowed to preach the gospel? You never heard of Rhode Island? You know what Rhode Island is? It is a Baptist state. It's a Baptist state. Look it up. It's a Baptist, Maryland, Catholic state. Rhode Island, Baptist state. Do a little history, do a little digging, you'll find it's true. We were a Christian nation, folks, before it was even allowed to be Christian. Christianity has nothing to do with politics. Nothing. That's a good banner to carry around. That's a good one. All I'm saying, y'all, it's rally time. Your hands may not fit all the way around the bat. It might be like my dad and always tell me to choke up and stick your elbow up. I say, son, you're swinging down here. And I'm like holding the bat down like this. He's like, choke up. But I don't want to choke up. Choke up, step up closer. Who's going to take the bat, step up to the plate. They're going to have their chin down, their elbow up. And they know they don't have it in them, not in their own strength. But I'm not looking for my own strength. I'm not looking for my own ability. I think God's, God's just fine. Who's going to step up to the plate? Thank you, Pastor. We have uh, time of invitation here tonight. Even before the uh, instruments play, if God spoke to your heart, why don't you come? Thank you for the message tonight. How appropriate to close out this spring program with this type of message. Who will step up to the plate?